morning everyone. Uh, are we talking about liver abscess? So a liver abscess is basically abscess. It is pus, a pus filled mass in the liver that can develop from uh, injury to the liver or intra abdominal infections which are disseminated from the portal circulation. The majority of these abscesses are categorized into pyogenic or amoebic, although the minority is caused by parasites and fungi. So there are three main causes of a liver abscess. Uh, it can be pyogenic, amoebic or fungal. In case of pyogenic abscess, uh, it can be often polymicrobial. Uh, it includes bacteria like E. coli and Klebsiella. Amoebic abscess is due to end amoeba histolytica and fungal abscesses most often is due to candida species. Epidemiology. The, what is the incidence of this uh, liver abscess? It's around 2.3 cases per a lakh of people. The risk factors is males are more predisposed than females. And of course, age plays a very important role of the type of abscess. So it depends on which age group that you are looking into. If it is around 40 to 60 years, so it is less likely it is due to a tra traumatic cause. Pathophysiology. So there are uh, two main things that we think about how this abscess is formed. One is bowel content leakage and peritonitis in case of a pyogenic liver abscess. Bacteria travel to the liver via the portal vein and resides there. The infection can also originate from the biliary system and uh, spread from the blood is also a potential etiology. History and physical examination. So uh, liver abscess, uh, uh, important thing is to do this uh, to find out the history and the <coughs> physical examination. So it, uh, so it includes the personal history of the patient, uh, occupation, travel, the place of origin, recent infections or treatments. Certain risk factors promote the development of liver abscess such as diabetes, cirrhosis, the male gender, elderly, immunocompromised patients and people who are on uh, proton pump inhibitors. The liver abscess manifests with uh, symptoms like right upper quadrant pain, fever and hepatitis. Now it is important to rule out um, other differential diagnosis when you have these kind of symptoms like viral hepatitis, cholecystitis, cholangitis, right lower lobe pneumonia, appendicitis, necrotic liver abscesses. Other causes of hepatitis uh, should be thought about like autoimmune drug induced, uh, acetaminophen toxicity can be mistaken although they are not usually painful, not so painful. After gathering a history, the review of systems and physical examination can provide a lot of additional uh, information. Symptoms. So fever is present in 90% uh, of these uh, liver abscess patients and abdominal pain in about 50-75% uh, of these patients and uh, also an uncover for this uh, uh, dark urine. Dark urine can be present uh, in, uh, in this kind of hepatitis. On physical examination, a patient can have hepatomegaly with an enlarged mass and jaundice. Although Charcot's triad, now Charcot's triad we know it is a sign of cholangitis, but if you get Charcot's triad, right, right upper quadrant pain, jaundice and fever, you should uh, always keep in mind the diagnosis of liver abscess. A small number of patients with hepatic abscesses may be present in distress. So these patients, when they come to ICU, they are not, may not be in stable state, they may be having an underlying uh, hepatic abscess and they can be in distress or in shock. In case of hydrated uh, cyst, they can also present a septic or anaphylactic shock. In the case of Klebsiella liver abscesses, in addition to the symptoms that we have mentioned, in Klebsiella, it is known to send septic emboli to the eye, meninges and the brain. So these symptoms, uh, there were symptoms of these organ systems can be present and can last even after the liver abscess is drained. In case of echinococcus infection, there is an initial asymptomatic phase. So these echinococcus infections don't generally start at adult age group. They can start off as a in the pediatric uh, age group. Uh, years later, uh, some of these patients can show clinical signs from the reactivation of this infection. The clinical manifestations depend on the type, the size, and the site of these cysts. Small cysts in non-vital organs can go um, uh, undetected, but large ones is in critical locations can present with the signs of compression and rupture. And the usual rate of cyst progression is, is 1 to 5 centimeters in a year. 
the liver is affected in 2 to 3 cases, 2 by uh, 2 third of the cases of echinococcus infections. Symptoms of compression usually start when the diameter is around 10 centimeters. So, uh, symptoms of compression can be biliary colic, <coughs> obstructive jaundice, portal and venous obstruction, Marshall syndrome, and uh, bronchial fistula. If it ruptures, it can immediately turn into a peritonitis and anaphylactic shock. Evaluation. So, uh, why do we need to evaluate? You got your physical, uh, you got a history and physical examination. Now you have to evaluate because this is uh, needed, you need to rule out other differential diagnosis. So, lab tests include, of, of course, we do a CBC, test for hepatocellular injury, uh, such as liver enzymes that are usually elevated in 50% of the cases. So, less 50%, they may not be elevated. Test to check uh, hepatosynthetic function like the albumin, the INR, the ALP can be elevated in around 90% of the patients, CRP, ESR and blood pressures to rule out bacteremia. In case of uh, amoebic, uh, if the amoebic abscess is suspected, such as in residents or travelers from Southeast Asia, a <coughs> stool test in serology for end amoeba histolytica should be performed. For the highlighted cyst, serology for echinococcus is needed. ELISA is the most sensitive and specific, and specific for echinococcus. After the initial screening with uh, ELISA, you have to do confirmatory tests uh, with immunoelectrophoresis and Im immunoblotting. Uh, and the serology positivity is dependent on the size and the site of these cysts. The initial test of choice is an abdominal, uh, of course, an ultrasound which shows hyper or hyper hypoechoic lesions uh, with occasional debris or septation. Then the next step is uh, using a contrast CT scan. And uh, this is more a uh, little more sensitive. It will show rim enhancement and edema, which is not, uh, may not be typical but very specific for infection. After all this, you might want to do a renal aspiration under guidance, uh, USB or CT guided, to identify the exact causative organism, uh, which is essential for diagnostic as well as therapeutic purposes. And there is something called a technician scan, which is supposed to have 80% sensitivity, which is less than a CT scan. Which, uh, which is 50 to 60 percent, uh, which is 50 to 60 percent for gallium and 90 percent for integral. That is the um, that what we use for the technician scan. Diagnosis is confirmed when there are cystic or solid areas in the liver that, upon aspiration, will yield fluid which is pos with positive cultures. It is important to obtain this test quickly and start the treatment because of the high complication rate if it is left untreated. Treatment and management. <coughs> so, uh, what are the two cornerstones of treating a liver abscess? Very simple. It's first of all to drain the source, uh, drain the abscess, and antibiotic treatment. So, drainage is needed and can be done under USG or CT. So, needle aspiration at times repeatedly may be required. Might be all that is required for abscesses less than 5 cm, but a catheter placement might be warranted if the diameter is most significant. Uh, and undrained liver abscesses may cause sepsis, peritonitis, or empyema. Percutaneous drainage with a catheter placement is probably the most successful procedure for more than 5 cm abscesses. And laparoscopic drainage is also used at times. Surgery should be done for peritonitis, thick wall abscesses, ruptured abscesses, multiple large abscesses, and previously failed drainage procedures. So after initial IV treatment, the oral route can be used safely in most cases to complete the course. Empiric antifungal treatment is crucial in when you are dealing with immunocompromised patients with a risk of chronic disseminated fungemia. <coughs> Empiric antibiotic coverage uh, when the organism is unknown should cover, so if you are doing it empirically, you need to be covering for um, Enterobacteriaceae, LLO, Streptococci, Enterococci, and Entomeba histolytica. So, what are different antibiotic regimens that we know of is Cephalosporins plus, plus metronidazole, BLBLIs plus metronidazole, synthetic pe penicillin, and uh, aminoglycosides with metronidazole. The duration of treatment varies but is usually from 2 to 6 weeks. So, it's like a prolonged antibiotic treatment. Alternatively, fluoroquinolones and carbapenems, these can be used if there is um, allergies or unavailability of cephalosporins or penicillins. If the source is echinococcus, the treatment uh, includes uh, al albendazole. 
and the therapy for adenofocus can go on for several years. Now the prognosis. Now uh, with new techniques available for drainage and antibiotics, uh, antibiotics specific for appropriate organisms, liver abscesses have much better prognosis now. So what is the in-hospital mortality of these liver abscesses? Around 2.5 to 19 percentage. The mortality rate is higher when it comes to elderly, when the patient is in ICU, shock, cancer patients, uh, fungal infection, cirrhosis, chronic renal failure, acute respiratory failure, uh, severe disease and biliary origin of abscesses. So uh, what about the recurrence? So the recurrence is frequent in patients who uh, present with biliary tract disease. In hydratus cyst, the prognosis is supposedly good. 57% will have a stable cyst. And even if the cyst grows, it will not usually cause symptoms. About 15% about will require surgery and that is often years after diagnosis. 76% of, of those who do not have surgery remain asymptomatic for years. And what about complications? <laughs> if it is untreated, if you leave this liver abscess untreated, it can go into peritonitis and shock. At times the area will get walled off and there will be chronic pain and discomfort in the uh, right upper quadrant with occasional nighttime fever can fall. Complications are also possible after the drainage. They include liver, uh, can include liver and kidney failure, intra-abdominal lesions, infection and recurring, or recurring liver abscesses. Other complications such as subnephric, subphrenic uh, uh, abscess, fistula to organs nearby, acute pancreatitis. <coughs> Abdominal or hepatic venous thrombosis, liver pseudo aneurysms. Infectious metastatic complica complications include end of thalamitis uh, or central nervous system sept uh, septic emboli. Thank you. That is okay. Thank you, sir. So, uh, just, uh, just for the pseudo system, right? So, what have you understood now from hepatic abscess? So, hepatic abscess. Uh, Per se, now you what you understood is that hepatic abscess is one difficult disease. Now, why do you think it is uh, uh, a difficult disease? But first of all, what is the incidence of hepatic abscess? How many hepatic abscesses have you seen in the hospital? Very few, right? Compared to the rest of the infections. If you look at ventilator associated pneumonia, pneumonia, urinary tract infection, abdominal infection, hepatic abscesses per se are a very, very uh, small number as compared to the rest. Now, first of all, why it has become small, you know? You must understand what was the first cause. What is the cause of the hepatitis of, of uh, hepatic abscess usually? What is the usual cause? Echinococcus. Huh? Sorry. Uh, VPS is no. Echinococcus. No. Gut bacteria. So gut from where? Where? So gut bacteria from where? I mean, gut is a big part. Is feeds and feeds. So it's usually you know it was initially considered that when you have appendicitis, it is from appendix that this gut microbial translocation occurs. Now, over the last couple of years, we have had great improvement in the uh, pickup and diagnosis of appendicitis. Okay, since there is a great pickup, what she says, gut translocation, that is absolutely right. What is gut trans? Gut from where? Appendix. That's from where it usually comes in. Okay, now that is why the liver initially used to get very badly affected, very, very badly affected because appendix used to be a very rare uh, diagnosis that is. We did an ultrasound, there was uh, people used to not go in for surgery immediately. So appendix used to worsen, perforate appendicitis, gut translocation, and that used to cause uh, liver abscess. Now so why does why liver? Why appendix and liver? I mean, why not intestine? Why not uh, uh, why not uh, kidney? Why not brain? Why not heart? Why not lung? Why liver? What is the answer to that? So you understand the question? You said gut translocation, so why liver? Why can't it be kidney? Why can't it be uh, heart? Why only liver? So what you must understand is the liver blood supply. That is what you must understand. Now what is important about the liver blood supply? Can you tell me what is different from liver blood supply and renal blood supply? Can you tell me? Or liver blood supply, lung blood supply? Can you tell me? Huh? Yes, exactly. It's got dual blood supply. Now that is very important for you to understand because if you have dual blood supply, it is getting blood from the hepatic artery as well as from the portal circulation. Now this makes it a dual blood supply organ that means maximum amount of blood is going into the liver. Maximum amount of blood is going to the liver. So if there is going to be a translocation into a vessel, the organ that will be likely be affected is the 
You understand? That's why the liver. But then why doesn't it happen? Then in every infection, same enteritis, associated pneumonia, uh, appendix, uh, anything, anything should cause first liver related issues. Why doesn't that occur? Why doesn't that occur? We just now discussed, right? Dual blood supply and liver gets blood, so the organism should enter into the blood. So why doesn't it occur? Earlier? So the, the beautiful part of the entire story is God has created something called kafir cells in the in the liver. Okay, these kafir cells are responsible for getting off all this funny bacteria out. These kafir cells are responsible for getting off all these funny bacteria out. It's a beautiful mechanism. Though God has made it in such a way that you have two blood supplies coming through the liver. There is kafir cells which are actually preventing this infection from getting inside. It's a beautiful mechanism. Okay, it's beautiful the way it functions. It's amazing. Artery, vein, perfect. Okay. So this is also precisely the reason because of the dual blood supply that the liver abscess is common where? If it, ha if it happens, where is it common? In the right lobe of the liver. Because it is in the right lobe of the liver that most of the blood supply goes to. Dual blood supply. Now uh, that's why if you have liver abscess, you normally see it in the right lobe of the liver. You don't see it in the left lobe of the liver. You see it, but it's rarer as compared to the right side. Clear on this? So now what has happened is appendicitis has become very easy to treat, very easy to form, uh, to, to figure out. So the incidence of liver abscess has come down. However, what is important for you to understand, even if the incidence is low, the chances of having mortality. Uh, mortality. So the mortality is high. So even though the incidence is low, the mortality is way higher. That's why the treatment of these abscesses are very, very important. Okay. So if you want to classify these abscesses, you could classify it in various ways. What did you classify it as? Size. Size and so, uh, so what did you, how did you classify no, uh, Based on the etiology actually. Okay. Uh, what? Intra-abdominal infection or traumatic. So, intra so that is based on how the, patho how the pathology occurs. Sister, come inside. Good morning. So actually you were supposed to have classified the way uh, people classify, various people have classified it in various ways. So you can classify it based on etiology. So you could say uh, it as what she said was traumatic, infective, uh, like that, you could possibly put it as traumatic or infective. Okay. Uh, um, the other way to classify it is by saying solitary and multiple. Okay, that you can have solitary and liver abscess or multiple liver abscesses. Okay. The third thing you can classify it based on the organism. So it could be bacterial, uh, fungal, or parasitic. Okay, it could be bacterial, fungal, or parasitic. It could be uh, bacterial, fungal, or parasitic. That's how it comes into. Okay, so there are three methods. When we have uh, abscess, uh, so you said pyogenic, you have fungal and you have bacterial. Uh, of which, which is the commonest? It's bacterial. bacterial. It's bacterial that's commonest, isn't it? Because the transfer. So now, how do you get an abscess? What is the pathophysiology of an abscess? What do you think? As you said, gut translocation is one way. Second way is actually biliary tract infections. So when you have biliary tract infections, uh, Amrit. To easy chala jao, huh? the respiratory tract will be calling. Huh? So biliary tract infections are one of the commonest uh, places where uh, you will have uh, uh, problems. So what happens is there's a biliary tract that's infected with all kinds of organisms, okay? And then that seeds into the liver, okay? That seeds into the liver. That's why you have you know you have pharyngitis, biliary tract infection, and then liver abscess. That's how it goes. Clear? Huh? The liver abscess. So unfortunately what happens with the liver abscess is very insidious onset. The clinical presentations are not very clear. Okay, it's very insidious onset. What happens is that a patient suddenly starts getting uh, some amount of some amount of not weaving well, not okay, sometimes it's vomiting, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that, something like that you get. Okay. But classically they will have fever. Okay, the fever will definitely be swinging. So there will be chills, there may be fever, it may increase in the night with sweating, this might what what you might you might hear, you might find yellowness of of the eyes because jaundice might develop. So these are the few things that you might see with an uh, maybe with a liver abscess per se. Liver abscess per se. So now that you understand that the commonest cause is, is bacterial, the commonest uh, reason is gut translocation. What do you think would be the likely organisms? Namrata? Uh, so when you say likely liver organisms, what is the pathophysiology? What did we say? From where it is coming? Gut. gut. Like so what is there in the gut? Uh. What is your gut? Tomorrow if you open your gut and put it out into the abdomen, what will happen to you? What kind of peritonitis you will get? Which kind of uh, organisms? Which organism will you get? 
coli is simple, no? Simple. What you get in the gut is E. coli, gram negative. So you get E. coli, you get Klebsia. So there are two organisms, which there are two three organisms that are very common. You will have E. coli, you will have Klebsia, and 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 if you say get uh, the in the abscess or that you get Staphylococcus, then you can say it's hematogenous spread. So if you get Staphylococcus, means it is hematogenous spread. Means somewhere or the other there is an infection. From that infection it has come in. For example, you have an infection in the heart valve. The heart valve is now seeded that organism. Okay, so for the heart valve, staph or strep, staphylococcus, streptococcus biliary will go hematogenously from there and seed the liver. So initially, now what you understand, it is going to be polymicrobial. Uh, the first time you have an abscess, it is going to be kind of polymicrobial. They may be gram positive, there is staph or strep. They may be gram negative, there is Klebsiella, okay, an E. coli. Uh, or it can be even fungal for that matter in those patients who are grossly even compromised. You understand? So, uh, first of all, abscesses will not occur in young individuals because our copper cells are working very beautifully. Uh, so, our copper cells are working very beautifully. So, unfortunately, in those patients who are elderly that you commonly see hepatic abscesses. You don't see it in younger individuals, you see it in elderly individuals. You see in people who are more than uh, 55, 50, 55, 56 years old, who are uh, a diabetic, who are immunocompromised, who have been transplant survivors, who are on transplant medications, who are taking medicines to reduce their immunity, you know, immunosuppressive medicines, chemotherapy patients. These are those patients who will get it. Another category of patients that we call about iatrogenic is what? How do you get iatrogenic hepatic abscesses? You get it by doing a procedure called a stase. You had patients that came into stase. Chemotherapy, chemoembolization. We have had two, three patients that came with taste. If you remember taste. But taste, what does taste do? Taste is, uh, um, you know, trans arterial catheter embolization. What happens over here? You have a malignancy. In that malignancy, there is some bleeding or there is something that is there and they want to uh, bulk of the tumor to come. Karna hai. So they embolize. They embolize the tumor. You, they embolize, that's called taste. What is called as? Taste. Okay. Now, what is the taste? What are we doing? We are actually causing necrosis. So if you are causing necrosis, necrosis is always an area where you can have seeding of organisms. So when you have a patient that comes in with taste, the first thing that comes to our mind later on, say a patient has undergone taste seven days earlier, okay, huh? then uh, you will start thinking that this might be a hepatic abscess. So the history taking becomes so important in these cases. So if it's a malignancy patient, have you undergone taste? So you know this is probably going to be bacterial abscess that's come from the origin of of uh, chemo You are understanding? Uh, for the provision of chemo Here, here, uh, so now you have understood that it occurs in elderly people, it occurs in patients who are immunocompromised, you, it occurs in patients who have got immunosuppressed condition, it may occur in patients with malignancy, okay, it is usually from gut translocation and now you know the organisms are gram positive, gram negative as well as anaerobes because it's from the gut. So now you have a fair bit of an idea. कि भाई अगर मेरे को एपेटिक एप्सिस अगर हो गया तो मैं अभी भी आर्मी पैसे अभी पैसे अभी पैसे नहीं सोचना है यू अंडरस्टैंड इट यू कांट जस्ट थिंक ऑफ वन पर्टिकुलर ऑर्गेनिज्म यू आर गोइंग टू थिंक ऑफ वी एंड बी पर हिस्टोरिटी आल्सो बिकॉज़ इट डस कम फ्रॉम द एब्डोमेन इट डस कम फ्रॉम द एब्डोमेन बट दैट्स नॉट द ओनली एंड प्राइम कॉज द प्राइम कॉज इज प्रोबब्ली गोइंग टू बी पॉलीमाइक्रोबियल क्लियर द प्राइम ऑर्गेनिज्म इज पॉलीमाइक्रोबियल सो दैट इज व्हाई यू कांट रेस्ट अपॉन द फैक्ट एंड से आई एम गोइंग टू गिव जस्ट मेटल डोज टू माय पेशेंट that is why the therapy becomes so important that you can't just give metronidazole to your patient. You are understanding what I am saying? You are understanding? Huh? You understood? Huh? Because once you say liver abscess, the only thing that comes to your mind is amoebic. There are, in fact, that is not the common cause. Common cause are all the rest of the things. Clear? Huh? So, what, when you say amoebic liver abscess, what is that? That is a clear distinct entity. You have entity by histolytica, which is a parasitic kind of organism, which actually causes amoebiasis. Amoebiasis and then amoebiasis then becomes amoebic liver abscess. You understand? So you will have a preceding history of amoebiasis and then an amoebic liver abscess. Or you may not have a preceding history, but you will find a certain investigation from the stool that actually gives you interbeba histolytic. Then you can correlate that there was amoebiasis, that is why he developed an amoebic liver abscess. Clear? That comes to the laboratory features. Unfortunately, the laboratory features are not very specific. Unfortunately. Unfortunately, this is one place where the laboratory features are not very specific and that's what medicine is all about. Medicine never has specific features. You have to corroborate three things together and say, okay, this is what the problem is. If, you, if, there was, if medicine was so simple that you can just do a test, everybody in the population would have been a doctors. You understand? That's where the skill of a doctor comes in, to interpret a certain laboratory investigation, to interpret the clinical features, to put all of them together and then give you a diagnosis. That's the skill of a doctor. 
You understand? You can't. Uh, otherwise, everybody. It's like everybody became COVID experts. Why? Because there was just one single diagnostic test. Everybody in the community became single experts, right? In COVID, right? Why? Because only one diagnostic test. It's simple. RT PCR code is positive. You are COVID positive. That's not how everything. All illnesses work. Okay, that's not how illnesses work. Illnesses work very various ways. So how do you diagnose this? So what's the laboratory features? First is clinical features you want to put in, which includes classically the right upper quadrant pain. Okay, you're going to have this right upper quadrant pain. That is always there, right uh, upper quadrant pain, which may also become pleuritic in nature because if it involves a pleura, you might have pleuritic pain. If there's an abscess that is near the diaphragm, it is involving the pleura, you may develop the right pleural pain, uh, pleuritic pain also when you have the abscess. The right upper quadrant pain is what is classically seen. Science wise, jaundice is what you see. So, what are the laboratory features? Then let's go to the CBC. Classically, these patients who are anemias, are even a surprise. We are also talking about immunocompromised, diabetic, elderly. What did they have on their HB? Anemia. Okay, they are probably going to have some kind of anemic tendency because of the fact that they are old, they are immunocompromised, they are immunosuppressed, they are diabetic, they are not those regular patients who are having their food properly. That is why they are developing something like this because their cuffer cells are not working. Right, their cover cells, if their cover cells were working, they would never have got something like this. Right, huh? that's the reason that they develop, uh, they have anemia. What is the other thing that you might see? So, what is the other thing you might see? So, you, uh, sorry? No. So, that is only neutropenic sepsis. What about uh, rest of the CBC? You have uh, differential, is it differential? So, that is a misnomer. Okay, so it is not this way that if you have eosinophil count high, then this is, uh, or if the eosinophil count is low, there is no parasitic infection. I was expecting an answer actually. Okay, so eosinophil count is not characteristic of anything when you are dealing with amoebic liver abscess. For example, if I will put it simply, if, what, you, what she is saying is, if the eosinophil count was elevated, this might have been a parasitic illness. Right? This is what you are thinking, right? But that is not the scene in amoebic liver abscess. If there is no correlation to the eosinophil count. For that matter, you cannot rule out amoebic liver abscess with a low eosinophil count. You cannot rule out. Otherwise, some people, what they do? They do the CBC, they find the eosinophil to be on the lower side and they say there is no amoebic liver abscess. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. It is not specific for that. Okay, so there is no change on the differential that you can notice and say that this is amoebic liver abscess or this is bacterial liver abscess. Do you understand this? Huh? Classically, they may have leukocytosis because of bacterial nature of the there will be a left foot shift, that all things will occur. Okay, when a neutrophil predominant ratio, uh, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio will be high. Then what else? What happens with the liver function test? What do you think will be wrong with the liver function test? Alkaline phosphate is increased. Very good. So what happens in a liver abscess classically is the alkaline phosphate will be high, whereas the SGOD HGBD is not as high. You understand? SUD HGBD will not be in ranges of 500s and 400s. SUD HGBD will be 70, 120, 130, something like that. Huh? But the alkaline phosphatase will be high. Okay, you don't have both together going up together, like how you have in other diseases. Your alkaline phosphatase being higher, but SUD HGBD is not very, very high. That is, the, that is what liver abscess looks like. It's not the rule, but that is how it looks like usually when you have liver function test at other. In the liver function test, what is important for you to look at? The albumin. Because if the albumins are low, you know these patients are not going to do well. Okay, they actually tend a very bad prognosis. If the albumins are low in a liver abscess patient, means they are not doing well. The liver is not okay. If the liver is not okay, they are not going to do well. You are understanding? Huh? Uh, albumin is produced from the liver. So if the albumin is low, you can understand that this patient is not going to do well. This is corroborated in large studies where they did albumin levels and they found out in those patients where there was hypoalbuminemia, the liver abscess uh, patients did not recover very well. In fact, those patients were the ones that had major adverse events. Clear? Okay, so we, we come to liver, uh, liver function. What about diagnostics? Which are the diagnostics you use here with respect to laboratory? Eliza. Sorry? Eliza. What is ELISA? What ELISA? ELISA is like, ELISA is a platform. Understand what ELISA is. ELISA is a platform. You understand? It's a platform. It's not like the test. ELISA is a platform. You must say what ELISA? What is what am I wanting to do? Okay, so what do you want to do? What is that? So what kind of test is this? Immunoglobulin. No, immune. So you should not tell anything. Huh? It must be clear what I say. Huh? So what do you do? So the only thing I can diagnose in this case, only thing I can diagnose in this case is what is MEBS. The only thing I can diagnose. 
Of course, my blood culture has changed, this culture, that culture, my bacterial infection, which is the usual thing. But if I want to diagnose something different, I want to diagnose amoebic liver abscess, then the only thing I can send is a stool. The stool for something called IHA for E histolytica, indirect hemoglobination antigen test for E histolytica. You understand? If I get that, it is a it is a kind of a supportive evidence that says that this patient had because E histolytica. Now, what is the intricacies of this particular test, E histolytica? E histolytica. Now, today, if I have amoeba abscess, now for years my IHA will be positive. When I have amoeba abscess say today, for years forward, my IHA will be positive. It just says that okay, I had amoeba abscess at some time in the past. Okay, so that time when we talk about that, we'll look at what are the numbers. There are some one is to two, like how you have in, in Vidal, you have numbers in that ratios. So when you have one is to thirty-two plus, means you have had amoeba abscess sometime in the past. Okay, but when you have higher numbers, one is to two fifty-six, you can say this particular insult might have been because of amoeba abscess that are occurred in the near in the near present, in the near past or present. Clear? So when you send for E histolytica IHA, I want the titers. I want the titers. So what I want to write in your in your summary: titers for IHA for E histolytica. That is what you want to write. Now titers IHA E histolytica. Where if I find one is to two fifty six, I would now say maybe maybe this liver functions, uh, this liver function derangement or this abscess is probably because of amoebiasis. Even then. Even then, what we know, even then, now so you might think, okay, this is a new abscess. Let me give me a minute or Even then, you must think like this: that if there is an abscess, this abscess is bathed by blood from all over the body. This abscess is bathed by blood from all over the body, isn't it? Polymyo, it is dual blood supply. All over the body, it is coming in. So there is a high possibility that this abscess, though is a new liver abscess, is going to be seeded by gut organisms, which include E. coli and Klebsiella. You have to still think like this. You are understanding, huh? Though we are looking at hepatic abscess, which is a VV abscess, which you have proven by E. histolytica, solitary, you have done anchovy sauce, and you have actually sent it for cultures, and you found that there is metronidazole. That culture becomes very important because you might get some more things in there. So, so the diagnostics will now change. The diagnostic will change. Say you you did it and you found streptococcus. You start looking for a hepatogen spread. You start looking in the spine. You start looking in the eyes. You start looking in the lungs. You start looking in the heart because from somewhere it has come, no? Streptococcus. It's not the organism that you normally find. Streptococcus miliary and Staphylococcus. Okay. Uh, if it comes from Klebsiella and E. coli, you say oh, it's from the gut. Let me look at the gut. So you look for diverticulitis. You look for some gut-related abscess. You look for appendicitis. You look for something in the gut, which is basically causing this. Are you understanding? Uh, understanding this. Okay, so depending on the organism, that's why the getting of that organism becomes very very important. It will give you a kind of a picture to understand. Okay, what I need to do in the future. Okay, so when you come back to the diagnostics, you see laboratory diagnostics. We talked about CBC. We talked about eosinophil count. We did talk about uh, e uh, IHA. Okay, this completes the laboratory. There's not much you can do. Uh, an LFT was talked about LFT and albumin. And what is the importance of having the LFT? What is the importance of uh, current phosphate? And what is the importance of uh, Simple CBC and eosinophil count, right? We looked at that. What is the next investigation you would like to do here? Next investigation. So, in investigations, you have a patient where I write up a cord of pain. Patient says I have a fever with chills. Ah, uh, he had sweating also, and he's not been eating well for the last couple of days. He's 66 year old gentleman. What is the other investigation you like to do? Imaging. Yes. So, what kind of imaging would you like to do, and why? What kind of imaging? Would you like to do? Sorry. It's a, it's a so, okay, an ultrasound. Ultrasound is something that you can easily do, isn't it? An ultrasound is easy, non-invasive, simple to do. Just give the ultrasound, you see the abscess. But it does your investigation end there. What do you like? We are in imaging, huh? Yeah. So be specific on that. You are doing CT with IV contrast. You can't just do a CT scan. Why is that? So because I want to now delineate my abscess. I want to see my abscess wall. I want to see what it's looking like. How many abscesses I have? Now, why does is the CT better or the ultrasound better? What is better? What is better, CT or ultrasound? What is better? Now, I, the question is: You are on ultrasound, okay? The ultrasound you have done is it's perfect to do an ultrasound because that is why train your eyes to understand what an ultrasound. What I am going to copy or find something. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, uh, what is uh, that is why train your eyes to look at the ultrasound again and again. If you look at the ultrasound again and again on every normal patient, you will fail to figure out the abnormality. So in ultrasound, what do you see? 
hypoechoic hypo lesion. You see, when you say hypoechoic, means what you're looking at? No, no, white or black? Black. black? black. You're looking at black lesion. So when you're putting an ultrasound, you will get large black lesion, uh, which you will call as hypoechoic lesion. That would signify an abscess. That would signify an abscess. Clear? Clear? So that's why, when will you find this? Only when you see normal, no? If you see, understand, okay, normal looks like this, normal looks like this, normal looks like this, then the day you put your abscess, there's something here. You know, you start looking like that. So, if you look at 20,000 echoes that are normal, the 21,000 echo will see your ultrasound will find out that this is there is something abnormal. Because abscesses cannot be only big, abscesses can be small also. And those small abscesses will require you to understand what is normal to understand the small abscess. Right? Clear? Clear till now? Huh? So, the app, that's why it becomes very <coughs> essential to the ultrasounds on the, on all patients that are there in the ICU. Don't waste your time chit chatting and talking around. Do this because you will not get this later on. I will finish my degree and then I will start doing. No, it doesn't work that way. Medicine is a continuum of care. It is a continuum of learning. You keep on learning every single day. Are you understanding? Huh? So that is why ultrasound needs to be done on every patient. It's important. You have this sonography machine with you. Do it. Okay? Huh? This is the eyes to, uh, of the abdomen. Okay? Then why CT then? If you are seeing it, then why CT? You said CT. Why? No. So you're close. What what about that? Pretty single multiple wall thickness. So you may get more data of which one of the most important data is less than one centimeter abscess, you can't see your ultrasound. If it's less than one centimeter, you can't see your ultrasound. One centimeter you believe that. So if you have an abscess that is smaller than one centimeter, you require to be seeing a CT scan. And CT with IV contrast will delineate the contrast, will actually show the wall of the abscess. Okay, it will show you multiple abscesses. So the data that you get with a CT scan is a little bit more than the data that you might get from just a ultrasound. You might end up doing getting diverticulitis, you might end up getting appendicitis, you might end up showing pleural effusion, you might end up showing pleuritis, you might end up showing subdiaphragmatic abscess, which is much more uh, concrete evidence of problems more than ultrasound. So you get a whole lot of information more than ultrasound, but you have to do it as CT as with IV contrast. Simple. Uh, so now what we have gone, we have gone through clinical features, we have gone through laboratory investigations, we have come to imaging. MRI is also excellent. However, MRI is costly and takes quite a long time. That's why we do a CT scan. MRI is also ex uh, excellent to do it. But MRI will take a long period of time, costly, uh, and uh, definitely that's why we do a CT. Clear? Now, since now we have gone to clinical, we have gone to laboratory, we have gone to imaging. So, we are come to treatment. So, what would the treatment be? What would the treatment be? So, so that's where you must understand that uh, the treatment of hepatic abscess is not very clear. Okay. So, what you said was drainage of the abscess. So, the ultimate and gold standard is to remove the abscess. The ultimate and gold standard is to remove the abscess. However, the indication or for that matter, the place where it works maximum is when your abscess diameter is more than 3 centimeters. Okay, <coughs> that's why you need that number. Ki kya hai abscess diameter? So, when the sir, liver abscess hai ICT mein. Aray yaar, number batao. Because that liver abscess ka numbers are worth it. This happened recently in one of our patients. We had a liver abscess, isn't it? Some months, one month ago. I would, so whoever called me from, someone of you know, you would have called me. And says they found a liver abscess. Are but tell me the number because that is what is going to determine what I'm going to do further, which will probably help me. If it is more than three, I want to accelerate a drain. I want to accelerate a drainage procedure. You understand? Huh? So we know very well that removal of an abscess anywhere in the body is going to reduce the bacterial load. Okay, similarly, more than three centimeter abscess, uh, we would probably want to drain and ensure that, and usually the first drainage. The patient is not successful, you require a second drainage many a times. So you do one drain, that is why you must do the ultrasound. That is why the ultrasound is so important. You do an ultrasound, bedside, you find that it is 5 centimeters, you have done an abscess drainage, it has become 2 centimeters, and then after 2 3 days, again it has become 5 centimeters, means what has happened? I need a redrain. You understand? That's why the abscess ultrasound becomes so important for you because you want to see it. Every time you can keep doing CD scans. 
you understand uh, so i will address if and is there again we had this patient right so we repeated again then we again put a second drain then we put a drain you know because it was not healing you got the point you understand so the, the drainage procedure will actually depend on the size and it depend on the recurrence clear i don't know if you complete all these things you done all these things yeah i'm done right mm. clear uh, uh, absence uh, uh, recurrence uh, this is how you will probably treat it then what are the uh, now what is the drug therapy of this pharmacotherapy kya rahega what will be the pharmacotherapy abhijit pharmacotherapy when you say pharmacotherapy what medicines are going to give So, what is the etiology concern? Polymicrobial. Exactly. So, if the etiology is polymicrobial, Niharika, uh, <coughs> what should be the treatment? Um, broad spectrum. Antibiotics. Broad, broad spectrum that covers gram positive, that covers gram negative, that covers anaerobics, that covers amoebics. You are understanding, huh? It's very important. That's why we start with etiology, right? We, everything that you do in medicine is adding like a jigsaw puzzle, adding this, adding this, adding that, and then deciding something. Everything in medicine is like that. Okay, uh, so that is the reason that you must understand the pathophysiology well. Then you don't have to think in the future that क्या करना है मुझे. If you know the pathophysiology well, you know the treatment without thinking. Are you understanding? I don't need to think for my treatment. I know this is polymicrobial. I know if it's polymicrobial, this could be gram positive, gram negative. It could be gut organisms. It could be E. coli. It could be Klebsiella. I know it's possibly if it's going to be maybe staph also. At my starting. I don't know what it is. If I don't know what it is, I give gram positive, I give gram negative, I give anaerobic. Simple. Hmm? Simple. So, what would be the gram negative cover? Something that covers everything in the abdomen. My president does that. Something that covers everything. Covers the gram positive. Yes, yeah, kidney mice syndrome. Okay, I can give tarpaulin if I want. It's going to cover staph and strep. Okay, I can give vancomycin if I want. Huh? I'm going to give a broad spectrum gram positive as well as gram negative cover. And I have given anaerobic cover, which includes metronidazole. Now the dose of metronidazole here is different though. The dose is higher. The dose is not 500 milligram TDS. The dose of metronidazole is 750 milligram TDS. Okay, the dose is 750 milligram TDS, right? Clear? So the first time I get my first time I get my amoebic liver abscess. Okay, I get my liver abscess. I don't know what is inside. I don't know whether it is bacteria. I don't know whether it is virus, uh, fungus. I don't know what what is inside. That's why I need to quickly do investigations. Because if it is amoebiasis, he requires only ten days therapy, seven to ten days therapy. If it is amoebiasis, he requires how many? Seven to ten. In seven to ten days therapy, patient should become normal. Usual circumstances. Clear. But if it is bacterial, he may require three weeks of therapy. So there's a big difference here. You understand? Huh? If it's bacterial, you are not giving three weeks of therapy. Now compare three weeks to seven to ten days. It's different. You understand? I will require IV. I will require oral. I don't know what all I have to do. I have to repeat investigation. It becomes a long term situation. That's the reason that as a doctor bedside, I want my thinking should be. But I need to know what is inside. Is this bacteria? Is this fungus? Is it amoebas? I need to figure out that. You understand? That's why blood cultures. That's why uh, a, a sample coming out from the Uh, from the liver, all that becomes extremely, 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 extremely important because the duration of antibiotics would actually depend on on what you are etiology. having or the etiology. So, if it's amoebiasis, seven to ten days. If it's bacterial abscess, it may be three weeks. In fact, sometimes even more than that because this is an abscess. It's an abscess that can't be drained on a regular basis. You understand? If you have an abscess like a diabetic foot abscess, ठीक है तुमने पैर काट दिया, abscess is out. इधर हम वैसा नहीं कर रहे आइडियली इफ यू कुड डू दैट द बेस्ट थिंग वाज लिवर का वो टुकड़ा ही निकाल दो दैट वुड बी द बेस्ट थिंग अगर इफ देयर इज एन एब्सेस ओके एंड 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 आई नीड टू गेट दिस ऑफ क्विकली आई जस्ट डू अ लिवर सर्जरी एंड डू जस्ट डू अ लिवर सर्जरी इट्स जस्ट टू मच हां इट्स जस्ट टू मच इट्स नॉट इजी ओके बट देयर आर इंस्टेंसेस वेयर इवन इन आवर हॉस्पिटल वेयर वी हैव हैड पेशेंट्स ऑन लिवर एब्सेस हु वी हैव गिवन मेटोडोजोल दे हैवेंट इंप्रूव्ड And they have seared multiply. They have had bacterial infection, and then we have gone for liver surgery to take that out. So when we do a liver surgery in such cases, they get better. They get better. That means you do hepatic cleanse. We get better. So surgical treatment is the gold standard. 
if you ask me surgical treatment is a gold standard you want nothing happens nothing improves you go surgical treatment patient will get better will get better because you have removed abscess that's what you do for an abscess we are doing something lesser by doing percutaneous drainage you understand it with the advent of all new medicine that has come in percutaneous techniques are working very well with the advent of all new techniques that have come in, in, in interventional radiology and uh, percutaneous techniques interventional radiology and percutaneous techniques have been the way we have been managing abscesses for a while by now okay for a while we have fairly done hepatic to be sir last three years three years ago three four maybe four five years ago we have done hepatic for hepatic abscess so the patient had come from the icu there was no improvement in the abscess the patient had received six weeks of metro and antibiotics bone marrow suppression had occurred because of huge amount of linezolid that they had given because staphylococcus had grown once so they had started linezolid this patient came with a wbc count that was platelet count that was 30000 80000 70000 something like that and bone marrow suppression had occurred because of the drug induced feature that he had luckily the drug the, when he stopped the drug the, the bone marrow suppression reversed luckily it usually does reverse but this reversed okay it reversed and uh, uh, patient got better on the wbc counts patient was not improving even here what we did this is the same thing that we did there we put in a drain we tried to take out the abscess one week passed nothing happened then we had more the alternative but went ahead and did a hepatic test this doctor nsk is patient but a hepatic to me and then that patient tap 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 started improving now that patient did that this is one of the only places in medicine where nails get more hepatic abscesses this is only one of the places where usually in most of medicine situations females are the ones who get problems but here males are more predominantly getting hepatic abscesses this was a female patient that we had okay so the female patient that we had Uh, who developed this and most probably it was polycystitic that means contiguous spread patient had it was a fat fair female patient was 55 years old diabetic who had actually features of pain fever and jaundice in the past it was cla- classical polycystitis which was treated on an empirical basis with antibiotics however the polycystitis did was uh, worsened and actually caused contiguous spread in form of liver abscess so it was staph uh, klebsiella as well as uh, staph klebsiella that was actually causing this Classically, bacterial abscesses are primary abscesses are multiple in nature, whereas liver abscess classically tends to be single and solitary and large. ठीक है, this was primary. There were multiple abscesses. All right? Yeah. Any questions now on hepatic abscess? So tomorrow, when hepatic abscess comes, now you should be able to give this exam paper very simple. You should be able to give this answers very simple. Forget exam. In your private practice, in your practice, you should be able to understand how um, how you deal with it. It's a sim- simple thing to do. It is something that just requires you to understand etiology, why it occurs, how it occurs, and what drug to give based on these particular simple things. So actually, hepatic abscess is very scoring and easy. If you think, keep things simple in critical care, everything is simple. If you try to complicate things, for example, you find what do I do with the percutaneous drainage if it doesn't drain by five mm lesser? That is different. You don't go to that. You don't go to the extent where you're going into the complications of everything. First, the basics get it right. If you get your basics right, 99% of the work is done. In medicine, 99% of the work is done with the basics. Are. You understand? Huh? Uh, 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 that is why just understand this much about every disease. Every disease, if you understand this much, it becomes methodically. If you understand this much about every disease, everything becomes simple. Okay.